Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome on this long holiday weekend. I am very thankful that you chose to be here with us in community. My name is Reverend Tamara Merrill. Ah, so we're talking about gratitude. And one of the things that I came to understand this week as I was looking at different quotes about gratitude was that gratitude is the act of receiving. And if attitude is the act of receiving, if we want more love, more abundance, more of the good stuff, it starts with being able to receive. With receiving comes vulnerability, which is a scary thing sometimes. <coughs> we are afraid of vulnerability. It exposes us. But without it, we're not exposed to creativity, to joy, and to love. <coughs> this week, I found myself looking at what it's like to go down a dark rabbit hole of non-gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> I found myself in the complaint department many times this week, <laughs> and it was very crowded down there. <laughs> <laughs> I made a lot of friends. <laughs> and when I saw what I was doing, I was like, ouch. My little angel of gratitude was trying to touch my awareness of a spiritual reality that exists, coexists along with my thoughts of insanity that goes on <laughs> in my brain. How many people think that sometimes their thoughts make them insane? <laughs> oh good, another crowd of good company. <laughs> And I, I was like kind of beating myself up for it. I found like, I, I went to buy some groceries and I was like, one little bag. And I go, $93? Oh my God. <laughs> Made a lot of friends in line talking about that. Um, <laughs> how the world is, the way the world should be, according to Tamara. Um, and I realized that in order for us as a whole, to take our spiritual tools, to make a world that works for everybody, we have to change our heart and minds. And we are going to be in states that do not promote spiritual bypass. Oh, everything is good, everything's good, everything's love, everything's peace. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, and there's a lot of suffering going on how, as spiritual warriors, do we battle suffering? How do we battle our own suffering and our own insane thoughts going down dark rabbit holes? I know that spiritual practices, as Elijah has said, are so important because we want to tip those balance, as he said last week, to have that 51% so that it strengthens our ability for gratitude. <laughs> It's really interesting how gratitude is being thankful for what we have and that creates more because it is the idea that your abundance is already here. And what about if we looked at that circumstances had nothing to do with our happiness but our perceptions? I'm even asking you to go a little deeper than beliefs. I'm talking about how we perceive the world. So right now, before I go any further, I want to invite you to know that you are only one breath away from being in the present moment and being grateful. Small little practice. So I invite you right now to go a little deeper with me to take three breaths, and we will be a moment away from being in the present moment of gratitude. 
So let's all breathe together. In, hold, and release. Breathe in, hold, and release. One more time. Breathe in, hold, and release. Neuroscientists say that's really all we need to do when we're in conflict to change our perception, to change where our thoughts are heading. I was watching um, very little spiritual TV this week, which I usually watch a lot to prepare for my talk. But I was watching a lot of comedy this week. And it was really enlightening. I was watching this podcast by, um, with Cory Booker, one of our four African-American senators in the Senate. And I love him. <laughs> He's wonderful. And he was being interviewed um, by Jon Stewart, who's a great activist and has done a lot of work in government through his um, loud and active voice for veterans and health care and many other things. So this story really moved me because <clears throat> as they were speaking in this podcast, Cory Booker kept stopping John Stewart. And John Stewart goes, you know, well, the right, the left, the Republicans, the Democrats. He said, stop. In the kindest way. He said, I'd like you to refrain from that language. I don't use that language. John goes, okay. He said, that's separatism. He said, we're here for humanity, for the good of humanity. Now, isn't that a refreshing thought that a, co a senator would say, I'm here for the good of humanity? Yeah. To not speak in a language of them and us. It's, it's dividing. It's separate thinking. It's not committed to the idea of humanity being in oneness. And, and it was like, wow. He's, he's having this man reframe his language because he wants to live in a world that isn't separate. And so as he was talking, he was talking about his uh, mentor, John Lewis. And if you don't know who John Lewis was, he was one of the senators, one of the four African-American senators in Congress who passed away not too long ago. And he was in the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King. And... He always said, when you're an activist, you're in good trouble. <laughs> and, and that was the, the, the young activists from the Black Lives Matter and many other movements were talking about good trouble. But the thing that sang to my heart, and I, I might get a little teary-eyed about this, was John Stewart was taking Cory Booker under his wing, and they were doing this um, week-long road trip to different states. When they came back, John Stewart was, I mean, uh, Cory Booker was walking in to um, Lewis's office, John Lewis's office, and there was this picture of this man and a, uh, you know, older uh, Caucasian man with his grandson or son, and John Lewis. And John Lewis says, I put this on my wall to remind me of my humanity. And he starts to tell a story about one day when he came to work, maybe 10 years ago, that this gentleman came in with his grandson, and he hadn't gotten into the office, and his secretary, administrative secretary said, I'll have to ask you know, Mr. Lewis if you can have time with him. And so the administrative secretary went to him and said, uh, so-and-so is at the door, he'd like to come in. And John Lewis's face dropped, and he said, of course, of course. The man came in with his grandson, and he stood there. And he was the man in the 60s during civil rights who was one of the Ku Klux Klan men who cracked open his skull and almost killed him. And he was standing there 
with his grandson in the most vulnerable place and asked John Lewis, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? And John Lewis said, of course. And the two men hugged and sobbed in each other's arms. That is transformation of the heart and the mind, transforming from hate to redemption. How do we get there? We can't force that. We can't kill it. We have to have compassion. We make others our enemy. It's so easy to do. When someone hates you, how can you hate your hater? Elijah just shared that with me earlier. How do we hate the people who, I mean, how do we not hate the people who seemingly talk about hating us? Whether you're a person of color, whether you're a person that isn't of color, whether you're LGBTQ, how do we conquer that feeling? And Senator Cory Booker said, with create, he said, what John Lewis shared with me is we conquer it with courageous empathy. Courageous empathy. Because it takes courage to transform things. It takes courage to rise above hate and pain and suffering. And it begins in our own hearts and minds. In order to get out of anything, we must go in. So when we think about polarization and language of them and us, it's so easy to be angry watching Putin and the people who are suffering to watch the things of, of the bad seeds that we carry in us that are watered to, to give suffering onto others because it is so much easier when we are suffering in pain to express that pain on someone else. It's much harder to go in with our own pain and deal with it. And the insanity of oh, the way we hold things, our, our righteousness. So that really moved me because it is our work. It is our spiritual tools as a spiritual warrior conquering the ego, the ego mind. Because the ego keeps us in this illusion that if only people thought like we did, the world would be such a better place. <laughs> if they only thought like me. Oh, thank God they don't. That's what I say. <laughs> Reflecting a little bit. And I thought, you know what? I love lilies. I'm a, I'm a lily girl, right? But what happens if the, what we think we want to homogenize the world is not what it's about? We scream and shout about diversity but then we get angry when it doesn't show up in the way we want it to. We're mad at the universe. I have a, a friend here walking around. <laughs> we get mad at the universe when it doesn't show up the way we want it to. Why isn't the universe doing what I want it to do? How come I don't have what I want? Doggone it, you know? <laughs> and the funny thing is, is we think we know better than the spirit of life, the essence. We think we know better than the thing we believe, whatever we want to call it, God, universal spirit, infinite intelligence. I know better. I know what's right for me. I know I'm right. What happens if, or I don't know if, what happens is when we turn towards spiritual reality and we talk about a world that works for everyone and all life on earth, that the tools that we show up with it's about being in the present moment 
and looking at possibilities, possibility conversations. So I was, uh, I was uh, challenged a few minutes later after watching that. Of course, thank you, God, right? And my brother from Brazil calls. He's been there. He's 73. He just turned 73 this weekend. He's been there for 50 years, and his wife's Brazilian. And he was in a panic, and he told me, Tamara, Tamara, I, I, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And my brother and my politics are very different. <laughs> and Lula just won, and he is the left, what we would call the left wing in Brazil. And he goes, there's, it's really pretty difficult there. And I, what I realized, too, is that the whole world is in an uproar in, in politics and governance right now. All over the world. It's not just us in this, you know, debate. And, and you know, they're blowing up cars. People, four million people are on the streets protesting that the election wasn't fair. Ever heard of that one? You know, and everybody's angry. And um, after listening to Cory Booker, um, I, I was like, okay, Tamara, like, don't jump into your politics, don't jump into your ideas, just deeply listen, you know? And I couldn't do it for the first moment. I deep, you know, he's my brother, I pushed my buttons, and I jumped in <laughs> and started arguing with him. And he goes, wait, wait, you're not listening to me. And I was like, ah angel on my shoulder of awareness said, He's, she's right, started listening to him. And we started talking about some really difficult subjects. And he started talking about um, teaching um, gender fluidity in the schools and blah, blah, blah. And I said, stop, you're gonna not, no, you're not gonna like this, but I need to stop you. Let's talk about possibilities. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, what happens if what's happening right now is we're born into this construct of reality. How many people voted, I, I know I didn't, to be born into this society to look as it does? Maybe we chose to be born, but I don't know about all the constructs of this reality. You know, when you think about it, who said that men can't wear dresses? Who said that men can't be nurturing? And who said women can't be fierce and powerful? And I recognized, you know, I couldn't wear pants to school until I was in junior high. You know, I mean, there were social constructs that we have been born into. And I believe what is happening, and I was listening to this physicist and the, a neuroscientist talk, about gender fluidity is really about a shift in our consciousness, trying to break the constructs that we've been born into. And it's coming out, with not good or bad or judgment, it's coming out in the physicality aspect of it, especially in the younger people. But what it's really trying to say, I think, is that we're evolving. Yes. And we're evolving very quickly. Now it's not just about girls wearing pants. I remember Marlo Thomas singing a song that boys can play with dolls too. I remember that, it was 1975. <laughs> and um, there was this big thing, my, my kids aren't gonna play with dolls, my sons aren't gonna play with dolls, you know? And, and the constructs that we just normally accept are from a survival base of our ego that was needed for whatever that time and space was. But now we're talking about possibilities and the fluidity in consciousness that maybe we're growing and evolving because we're going out in space. We may meet, meet some other life forms. Can we not understand that if life is infinite and there are infinite universes, that we are not, hopefully not the only semi-intelligent <laughs> beings <laughs> in the universe, right? Hello. And so, what happens if it's preparing us not to identify so much with these preconceived, preconstructed ideologies, mm -hmm. including our politics, including our belief systems, because they're polarizing us. 
You know, I think about all the time uh, when Cory Booker was talking and uh, John Lewis said about Senator Hubert, I hope I got his name right, who's, um, who's a, a, a Republican senator, and uh, John Lewis had made a joke about him, and Cory Booker goes, I want you to know something. That hurt me deeply. And, and John Lewis said, why? He said, because who, Senator Hubert is, is one of my friends, and I love him deeply. And we have passed bills, bills for children, the child credit tax, the foster care program. He goes, he is a good man. We don't see eye to eye on pol all the policies, but he's a good man. We forget our humanity of these other people that don't think and talk like we want them to, or that share our ideologies, right? And it was beautiful to hear someone talk about reaching across the aisle in the name of humanity, in the name of spiritual evolution, in the name of raising above who we think we are in these limited identities and limited belief systems, because trust me, belief systems are not laws of the universe. They are just, hmm, they are just as convoluted as the next one, because we don't have all the information. We're growing. Can you expect a five-year-old to do algebra? Um, no, they're not there yet. And in a way, I think in our evolution, in 100 years, people are going to go back and pretty much laugh at us <laughs> and say, whoo, those guys were primitive. <laughs> oh, one step away. <laughs> That's the point. We lose our humanity. We lose our humanity. How do we get that back? We get that back by the recognition that there is more possibilities than what we think we've got going on. And to me, that's super exciting. One of the things I also w watched was um, David Chappelle, which he's been, you know, the, a lot of anti-Semitism, <sighs> it's gone up like 50% in the country recently. And he went out and did a comedy sketch, and, and some people got really upset. And afterwards, he said something that was really remarkable to me. He said, you know, policemen, I empathize with them. They go out there, they feel like there's a target on their back. People don't like them just because they're wearing the uniform. And he goes, I understand that. He said, white, brown, he goes, people go out and they're judged by the color of their skin, whether it's white or black or brown or, or Asian. And he goes, and, and it's sad. And he goes, I understand that. He said, the difference between me and you, and he was talking to the commentator, he said, is that I don't hate the people who hate me. I hate the feelings. I was like, wow, I hate the feelings. And in that, it made me think, in order to change our feelings, we have to work on courageous empathy for ourselves and for humanity and find ways that we build bridges to uphold the possibilities of being human.